All right, let's go ahead and get started here, folks. Um, today, we're going to continue on with dienes. Um, and we will, we're going to spend a significant amount of time um, in the next, if not this lecture, the next lecture, talking about molecular orbitals. So prepare yourself. I know that's not everybody's favorite topic, thinking about orbitals and those orbital energy diagrams, um, but it is gonna actually change which products we get for a couple of these conjugated diene reactions are going to be dependent upon um, what the molecular orbitals look like. Um, so that is going to be coming your way. Um, but for starters, let's just review um, where we left off, and just a reminder of how thermodynamic control versus kinetic control works, right? So remember, the whole idea with kinetic control means it's the product that's easier to make quickly, not the most stable product. It's the product that you can make fastest. And so th that will frequently be um, not as stable as the most stable as the thermodynamic product. The kinetic product is just the one that's gonna have the lowest transition state barrier. And, that, and we need to remember as well that, that when we, if we look at the kinetic energy of a molecule, if we have kinetic energy of a molecule here and on this side, this is just the number of molecules that have that much energy. It's, it's not like at a given temperature, everything has the exact same amount of energy. For a specific temperature, you're going to have a distribution of molecules that looks kind of like a bell curve. Um, this, that distribution is called a Boltzmann distribution after the guy who invented entropy and statistical thermodynamics, which this is all based on. Um, and the Boltzmann distribution just says, okay, the average kinetic energy is gonna be proportional to temperature. But that means that half of your molecules could have more energy than that. And so since nothing can have negative energy, it's not a true bell curve. It starts down here at zero and it kind of looks a little bit like a bell curve and then it trails way off this direction, right? And so at a given, at a set temperature, the average kinetic energy is going to be based on this distribution. Half the molecules have less energy than that. Half the molecules have more energy than that. And uh, I went to a higher temperature. I don't change the, sh I change the shape of it just a little bit, but mostly what I do at a higher temperature is I flatten this curve out. So, and that what that means is that my average is going to be higher. So Ke average for the red temperature is going to be higher than Ke average for the black line, right? And so the only time any reaction can happen is if a molecule has enough energy to make it over that transition state barrier. So what's really happening, if I go back to the potential energy surface, when, when we're making the kinetic product, if we're at low temperatures, that means that a smaller proportion of the molecules have enough energy to make it over each of these barriers. And the shape of this, this um, curve of the Boltzmann distribution, temperature is an exponential factor. And so at a higher temperature, you're gonna very quickly get to a point where, where half of the molecules can make it over that barrier as you increase temperature. But if you're at a low temperature, whatever can make it over this barrier is you're not going to be able to make it over the other barrier at the same time if you're at a low temperature. If you're at a low enough temperature, nothing happens. 
But if your temperature that's low, but not too low, you can make it over the easy barrier, but you can't make it over the high barrier. Right, and if you actually, if you want a system that is, that is actually statistically identical to these molecules and these reactions happen, happening, think about getting a cardboard moving box from Home Depot and putting a dozen ping pong balls at the bottom of it and picking it up and gently shaking it. None of your ping pong balls are gonna fly out necessarily until you start shaking it harder, which is equivalent to raising the temperature. Now, if I cut off half of that box, if I cut the, the, a hole in one of those sides so that it's way lower than going all the way over the top, now if I shake it gently, there's a, there's a chance that the ping pong balls could go out the lower hole. They're still not gonna make it over the top barrier, but they could make it over the lower barrier. And as you increase the temperature by shaking it harder and harder, you've got a better chance of it going either direction. Right, so that's why at higher temperatures, we're gonna favor the thermodynamic product because we can basically pick which of these, which of these barriers we wanna go over to get to the most stable product. The equilibrium product is always gonna be the one that's the most stable but we can't get to that equilibrium product unless we have enough temperature, enough kinetic energy to make it over that barrier. Right, and so there are other ways we can, we can adjust these, um, what proportion of the molecules can make it over specific barriers by doing things like adding a catalyst. Adding a catalyst doesn't change our final reaction energy, so it won't change what the thermodynamic product is, but it might, but it changes what the transition state barrier is which means at the same temperature, we could expect different kinetic product, potentially. And changing pH can do that as well, because changing pH, a lot of times having H pluses around is a catalyst in OCHEM, right? You need something to protonate that first molecule, or you need sometimes a base as a catalyst, because you have hydroxide that can act as a nucleophile, right? So all we're really looking at for this week's lab was, looking at, okay, at, if you look at it at zero Celsius, we're looking for what's the kinetic product. At 80 Celsius, we were looking for what's the thermodynamic product. And if we, if we had different answers there, those two answers will allow us to, can, to draw a figure that looks like this. And then we can label each of these, as, each of these potential energy surfaces as, um, you know, the, the kinetic product you could label as the um, cyclohexanone semicarbazide, and the, the other one you could like label as the furfural semicarbazide. Um, so that's that's all we're really looking for is to identify what this potential energy surface looks like, and you don't have to get the the heights exactly right. When I say I want them qualitatively right, that just means draw the right one higher than the other. Right. I'm not looking for you to get in there with a ruler and measure out. You guys don't have enough information to figure out exactly what these transition state barriers are. But you do have enough information to say which one is more favored at which temperature. All right. And then therefore, what does this shape look like? And really, you're not even going to have that first step, that proton transfer step. We're starting right here in the middle. So it can be very simple. It doesn't have to be a very complicated potential energy surface. All right. Any questions on, on this before we do some more practice with it? All right, we, we proposed a mechanism that does something similar to this, but for, for practice sake, why don't you guys try um, where it's the addition reaction. So it's the potential energy surface we were just looking at. It's gonna be a proton transfer followed by a nucleophilic attack. Try and draw your mechanism that's gonna show both products that you could get the one four adduct and the one two adduct.
All right, so let's start working through this. The first step looks the same for both mechanisms, right? Our first step for each of these is just, we need to start by protonating something somewhere. So where, where are we most likely to protonate? It has to be one of a couple places, right? Let me... If we have HBr, these electrons from one of the two pi bonds are going to grab the proton. Bromide keeps its pair of electrons. So we're going to start by making a an intermediate that's either going to look like we're either going to add the hydrogen, new hydrogen down here, then we'd have two hydrogens on there, one of which is new. We either get this intermediate or We could protonate at the top. So that would be, should just do this in a different color. Which of these is going to be more favorable? They're both going to have some resonance, which is why we're not going to ever, when we do these steps, you're never going to protonate on the inside carbon of a conjugated diene. We would never put it here or here. Never put the new, the new hydrogen either of those spots because then we get zero resonance right and resonance is way more stable than than no resonance any any thoughts yeah i said blue maybe blue why sorry i don't have my chat up let me get that up so i can see um I don't know, maybe, I don't know. I thought maybe the tertiary carbon there would be, or I'm sorry, the quaternary carbon there would be um, more stable. You, you, you had it right, it is tertiary and you're, that's exactly the right reasoning. Okay. In both of these cases, we have resonance to make things more stable, but in the blue case, it's a tertiary carbocation that's made more stable by resonance as opposed to a secondary carbocation made more stable by resonance. The red one, no matter how you try and draw the resonance structure, you're going to have your tertiary carbon is going to stay in a pi bond, right? It's either a pi bond up or a pi bond down, which means you could never put the positive charge on the tertiary carbon. So the blue structure is going to be the more stable intermediate. So we're not going to see the red one. So I'm going to erase that and redraw our blue intermediate over there so that they have, I have room to draw the next step. All right, so we have this intermediate, which can do one of two things. Either you can have the bromide can come in here and attach directly, and we would get the one, two adduct 
if we're putting bro the bromine attaching it to the to the carbon that's directly adjacent if we don't draw any resonance structures we just put put the bromide right next to the hydrogen we added just like it was a classical alkene addition um then in that case that's the one two adduct because we're putting them the hydrogen and the bromine on adjacent carbons so that would give us is everybody okay if I erase the first step? So the the one two adduct would look like Bromine added to the same to the tertiary carbon, and that we made a new stereo center by doing that. So we have to say plus en because we have an equal probability of attaching the bromine on top or on bottom. Or the other way of writing it that would give you full credit um, would be to not show the stereochemistry in the bonds. And then instead of putting plus en, you would write it as R plus S. Right? It's, it's assumed if you say R plus S that, that um, the reader can figure out which of the carbons is asymmetric. Elfie? Um, I'm just, how did you, how, how do we know that we're creating a stereo? center when we did that what is what's your number one clue? That step what what's your number one clue that there's a stereo center mm. oh Anybody? it's because there's four things okay <laughs> yeah dir, dir, dir. but i was just like there's four things bonded to it before but it's a pi bond okay exactly pi bonds don't count because they're flat they're planar all right so this would be our one two adduct Our one four adduct, it's going to be the same step, but we just have a resonance structure to draw before we can draw our addition, before we draw our nucleophilic attack. So our new our resonance structure would look like just one one um, arrow to draw the resonance structure, and then remember to use your resonance arrow. To show this, if we want to show that it's a resonance structure, you draw the double headed arrow um, to show that it's happening backwards and forwards. So then our resonance structure then looks like huh. and so all we did was was move the pi bond over and now we do the exact same thing our bromide can come in here and attach and so our one four adduct has the bromine on the bottom carbon So those are our two possible products. That's how we would draw the resonance structure for each of those product, products. The only difference between the two is that I had that resonance structure in between. All right, so which of these would we expect to be the the thermodynamic product, which of these two possibilities is going to be more stable, favored by equilibrium? Bottom. Why? 
uh, the separation of all the big group. So Sterix is one one possibility, and that definitely plays a role. The larger role, you're correct, it is the bottom structure, but the larger contributing factor is the fact that we made the more substituted alkene. A alkene that has three carbons attached to it, that like we have here on the on the red one, is going to be more stable than an alkene that only has two carbons attached to it. So we have both sterics and the more substituted that Zaitsev's role. When you're choosing which product to make in an elimination reaction, the most stable product is the more substituted alkene. So what this resonance structure just allows us to do is it allows us a wider variety of carbons we could put our bromine on because we're not just choosing between these two carbons, we can also choose to put it there. And so we're going to put it in the position that puts the remaining pi bond on the more, um, more substituted carbons. All right, so the one four adduct. Is more stable. So we'd expect that to be our, our thermodynamic product. Um, the one two adduct, though winds up being our kinetic product in these circumstances. Right? So at low temperatures, we can favor the one two adduct. Um, and actually, I didn't specify here, but this would also give us an R plus S situation, right? Our one four adduct. We still have a carbon that has four different things attached to it. Um, the, the kinetic product, the one, two adduct is going to be favored at low temperatures. It's the kinetic product. It's thought that that's, it's not entirely clear exactly why it's the kinetically favored product, but we can do the same, the same experiment that we did, well, that, that I gave you data for in lab on Tuesday. Um, we could do that same experiment, do this reaction at low temperatures versus high temperatures, and we can show that the blue product is the kinetic product. And it's thought to be just because when you donate that first hydrogen to break the pi bond, your bromine is already right there. So it could happen in two steps, but it's really close to being happening in one step, doing that addition um, to both sides of the carbon at the same time. So the kinetic product is the one, two adduct. The thermodynamic product is the one that gives you the more substituted alkene. Right, so depending on where the substitutions are, that can be actually a, the one two adduct can be both the kinetic product and the thermodynamic product, depending on the exact molecule. But frequently we will see this be the case where the kinetic product is the one two adduct. Kinetic product will always be the one two adduct. The one, the more stable, the thermodynamic product, it will always be the more substituted alkene whether that's one, two or one, four. So there, there could, we could draw a molecule where the kinetic and the thermodynamic product are the same. And that means you're gonna favor that product no matter what temperature you do the reaction at. All right, is everybody feeling a little bit better about mechanisms. These are simpler mechanisms, it seems like, than the ones we did last last half of the quarter, right? Are no oxymercuration, no hydroboration. Um, so these, you should be able. We are we're talking about more variables now, bringing resonance in, and making you remember Zaitsev's rule. But at the same time, the mechanisms themselves are fewer steps, and they're always going to follow our trend of look for your positive charge, look for your electrons, and draw an arrow from the electrons to the positive charge. Dash, Bill. All right, so you don't have to draw the mechanism for this one. You guys, I'm going to give you guys a head start again. 
draw the products, tell me which one's the kinetic product, which one's the thermodynamic product, and at zero Celsius, which one do you expect to be the favored product? All right, so we're gonna have two possibilities. The first possibility is our one, two adduct. And both of our pi bonds are symmetrical in this case. So we don't need to worry about which pi bond we're adding to. That simplifies things compared to the last one a little bit, right? So our one, two adduct would put our bromine on the same carbon as one of the methyl groups and we leave the other pi bond alone. We do not need to specify we made a stereo center. We made a carbon with four things attached to it. So four unique things attached to it. Um, so that means we have to specify R and S. And our one four adduct. Is going to look like this. And did we make something with four unique things attached to it again? Yeah. So the the two meth the two carbons that have the methyl groups only have three things attached to them. They're both still trigonal planar, but the carbon at the bottom that we added the bromine to now has four unique things attached to it. So. R plus S. And we just got done talking about how do we know which one is the kinetic product? Kinetic product's the easy one, right? It's always the same. So that's going to be. The one, two. So 
So at low temperatures, we would expect to make that one. Which one's the thermodynamic product? What's our rule for that one? The more substituted alkene. So the blue more blue. substituted alkene. So that'd be the blue one. So if it had enough energy to get there, we would expect most of our product to be in the form of the 1,4 adduct. But if it doesn't have enough energy to get there, if we're at a low temperature, we're going to make mostly the kinetic product. So in zero Celsius, we can usually assume that anything colder than room temperature is going to be favoring the kinetic product. Sometimes even at room temperature, we can expect it to favor the kinetic product, but to specify, um, to make it obvious the, that um, we're talking about the kinetic product, we're just going to say zero Celsius um, or less than room temperature is going to give us the kinetic product. If we said 80 Celsius, if we said anything warmer than room temperature, then we would expect the thermodynamic product. Right, so our, our final answer here, at zero Celsius, we're gonna make the kinetic product. She's fine, she's fine. If she's a problem, we'll get rid of her. Not, I'm not talking about my daughter. If the cat's in here with me. All right. So we added a new wrinkle by having two possible products here. And we now have the language to discuss it, kinetic product versus thermodynamic product to be able to understand how we can favor one versus the other. But there's, this really isn't a new reaction to us, which is nice. We're just further exploring what addition products look like. Um, and that's good because the rest of the reactions from this chapter are totally new reactions, totally new mechanisms. Um, they're, they're what are known as pericyclic reactions, which means that they're gonna result, or they're going to um, be the result of a whole bunch of electrons moving at the same time. Um, and they, so that's not gonna go in sequential steps like we're used to with these mechanisms. It's gonna be a whole bunch of electrons moving all at once with these conjugated dienes. Any other questions on this one before we keep going? All right, so these pericyclic reactions, they're, they're really interesting in that they what makes them a pericyclic reaction or pericyclic reaction, two pronunciations for the same thing, um, is that they're, they're not ionic or radical based. They're neither of those. And so if they don't go through an ionic or radical intermediate, um, then we, the other option is that everything has to happen all at once. Any steps that are going to happen are gonna happen all at once. And so there's three major categories of these. We're gonna spend most of today talking about cycloaddition. Um, but there, and a cycloaddition is kind of exactly what it sounds like. If you start with a bunch of pi electrons, you can break some pi bonds to make new sigma bonds. And so it's like an addition reaction, except you're doing it, everything happening at once. And because if you have a whole bunch of pi electrons, they can all move simultaneously, it's gonna look a lot like drawing a resonance structure. This looks a lot like how we would draw a resonance structure for a benzene ring, right? You've got six things in a, in a hexagon, six, you know, or uh, six electrons anyway, three pi bonds in a hexagon, and they're all going to rotate at the same time to make that cyclic structure, that cyclic motion of the electrons in a benzene ring. These kind of look a lot like that. 
except that instead of just moving pi bonds around, we're breaking pi bonds to make new sigma bonds. Um, we can have a similar thing happen. And what makes it a cycloaddition is that we, we have two different molecules to start. And at the end, we wind up with one molecule. So basically, we're, we're sticking these two pieces together to make one new ring structure. So hence, cyclo addition. We're making a cyclo group by adding these two molecules together. Um, electrocyclic reactions are somewhat similar, except that everything starts as, this, as one molecule. If you had this, this molecule would be what's known this would be known as a triene instead of a diene. If you had one, three, five hexatriene, that, that molecule will spontaneously rearrange itself to, get, to give up one of those pi bonds and turn, turn that pair of electrons into an extra sigma bond. So we make a new cyclo group from the pieces that were already there. That's the difference between these two, between a cycloaddition and an electrocyclic reaction, is your cycloaddition, we're starting with two separate molecules and sticking them together like a seatbelt, versus our electrocyclic reaction, we're starting, we have the same number of carbons before and after on that molecule. And then this last one is a little bit more rare and a little bit trickier to see why we would care, <clears throat> excuse me, um, but we can have something that looks kind of similar to a um, electrocyclic reaction where we wind up moving three pairs of electrons, but we don't wind up making an entirely new cyclo group. We just basically change where the sigma bond is. And this is going to only going to really happen if, if rearranging it allowed us to make more substituted alkenes. So just like we favored the 1,4 adduct when it gave us the more substituted alkene, if we can rearrange the pi bonds to give us something that is more substituted, um, then we will see that. And that's that sigma tropic rearrangement. All right, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that my cat is trying to get in the way, and I'm going to go throw her in the garage. I'll be right back. All right. So we're going to warm up with cycloaddition because cycloadditions are, are actually easier to understand how the stereochemistry works and how to, how to think about it in terms of molecular orbitals. Um, they tend to happen in, in a way that makes a lot of sense, that we can use, that we can use our natural intuition, not natural. OCHEM is pretty unnatural to most people. Um, but we can use our intuition that we've developed to explain how it's going to work. And then we can apply our ideas of frontier orbitals of the HOMO and the LUMO to explain why the, why the products look the way they do. And then we're going to continue on to talk about the electrocyclic reaction. And that's the one where if you change the conditions a little bit, you get different stereoisomers based on what the HOMO and the LUMO look like. Um, essentially, we can we can force the reaction to go through through the homo instead of or through the lumo instead of the homo if we shine light on it. Because if we shine light on it, we promote electrons from that from the highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital, which means we can shift which way this electrocyclic reaction happens. Does it rotate clockwise versus counterclockwise? And that's going to be based on, did you shine light on it or not? And what the HOMO and the LUMO look like. So let's start with the 
the classic cyclo addition. This is one of those named reactions that that um, they love to throw in standardized tests. Um, it's one of the most the most asked about, I guess would be the way to put it, um, reactions that you guys will see. Uh, it's called the Diels Alder reaction. And it's it's a cyclo addition where we start with a diene and another pi bond. And it's what's known as a four plus two cyclo addition. And it's four plus two because um, it's called a four plus two cyclo addition because you four of the pairs of electrons that are, or four of the electrons that are involved start on one molecule and two of the electrons start on the other molecule. So it's not just about the where, when we name this, when we call this a four plus two cyclo addition, we're talking about the electrons, not the carbons. Because you can have more than one thing attached over here, right? So you could have a much larger molecule than just four carbons plus two carbons. But the part that's reacting is four electrons from the diene and two electrons from the dienophile. So nucleophile seeks out nucleus, electrophile seeks out electrons. I de a dienophile, which is a mouthful, um, seeks out a diene, specifically a conjugated diene. Right? And so we really, just like we don't necessarily have to use the word nucleophile when we're talking about a random molecule, we only use the word nucleophile if we're going to have it participate in a nucleophilic attack, right? Otherwise, we just call it hydroxide, um, for instance. So dienophile, we're only going to really use that term if we're going to start talking about a diels alder reaction. Um, and so a dienophile can be anything with a pi bond, basically. Anything with a pi bond, because it can go through this concerted cycloaddition reaction um, transition state where you wind up breaking a pi bond on the dienophile, moving a pi bond over, that looks like our resonance structure from the last, from our last reaction. And then we break the second pi bond on the diene to make another sigma bond. So we're forming two new sigma bonds. We're moving one pi bond over. And the result is we make two new sigma bonds at the expense of two pi bonds. All right, and they've done lots of, of um, studies to show that this all happens at once. There's no ionic intermediate. There's no steps that happen here. It happens all at once. And you get a transition state that looks like all of those electrons moving at the same time all of those pi electrons are sort of moving in the same direction. And you can draw the arrows. If we drew the arrows um, counterclockwise instead of clockwise here, we'd get the same product, right? So it doesn't really matter which way you draw the arrows here. Um, but the result is you get a transition state that looks, a lot of times we'll draw it like this, where you've got pi bonds that are broken, being broken, drawn as dotted lines and new pi bond forming as a dotted line and our two new sigma bonds drawn as a dotted line. And if I see the new bonds that are being formed are gonna be those bonds. Those are the ones we're in the process of making. And the bonds that are being broken are the original pi bonds. These bonds are all going away. All these pi bonds are going away. And we're turning them into the blue bonds that are drawn here. And so then our final product
it's going to look like this. Um, and it can happen backwards. It's just a lot less common because this reaction is always going to be downhill in energy. The Diels Alder reaction is always downhill in energy because pi bonds are in, are inherently and always less stable than sigma bonds. And you guys know how often I like to use absolutes, but I will say that pi bonds are always less favored than sigma bonds. Sigma bonds, you get better orbital overlap. So sigma bond, if you can make sigma bonds, that's always going to be more favorable than making pi bonds. Right, so, but if you go to high enough temperatures, we can get this reaction to happen backwards. And they call that the retro Diels Alder. Retro means backwards, right? Um, why would we favor this at high temperatures? What's happening at high temperatures that would make this more favorable to split these molecules up? Probably entropy, more molecules. More molecules, exactly. The same reason that we favored elimination at high temperatures over substitution or addition. This is basically a really complicated elimination reaction. Um, it behaves, its transition state is going to look just like the Diels Alder because we are literally starting down here and going backwards. So we have to have a high enough, we have to have a high enough temperature to get over that barrier, which is now a lot bigger than it was. And again, at high temperatures, we're going to favor the side that has more pieces, more randomness, which would be more distinct molecules. So you're still not going to get great yields with it because you're going uphill in enthalpy. The bond energies are uphill to go from sigma bonds to pi bonds. But you can make the entropy piece big enough to favor it, even if it's still only going to give you, you know, 60% yield or something like that. You can still get your original pieces back um, if you put it in the right conditions. All right, that's a good, as good a place as any to, to take our break. Let's come back at nine and we will start talking about how do we know where X goes.
All right, folks, let's keep going here. <clears throat> so just a reminder what the transition state looks like. The transition state is going to look like all of these electrons moving at the same time. So the mechanism step is going to look like, um, I know the, the mechanism in the book the figures that I was just showing have the arrows drawn towards the new bonds. I prefer to draw them towards the new nucleus so we can follow our rule of you always draw arrows from electrons to a nucleus. So I prefer to draw them a little bit like uh, more like this. And the natural result of all of that is that the dienophiles pi bond turns into a sigma bond. One of the dienes um, pi bonds turns into a sigma bond, and we move the remaining pi bond over one spot, over one carbon. And as a result, everything still has a full valence when this is all done. Right. So the and the fact that we we can show that this is all happening at once. The transition state is, looks like everything happening at the same time, tells us that there's gonna be some interesting things happening with the transition state and that that's going to dictate which isomers we actually wind up seeing. So depending on what's attached to the diene and what's attached to the dienophile, we're gonna get, we can get more than one possible product. So figuring out exactly what this looks like means we have to think about what the shape of these pi bonds is and how we can get the new orbital overlap to happen. Um, and the easiest way to think about it is that your dienophile, if you think of your diene as being a flat planar molecule, your dienophile is either gonna come from on top to form our new bonds, or it's going to come from below to make our new bonds. And that results in if we wind up with more than one possible stereo, stereo isomer, um, if our diene, sorry, if our dienophile starts out as being cis, our product is going to be cis. If our dienophile starts out as trans, our product is going to be trans, which kind of makes sense, right? If you think of, of the di diene as just being sort of locked into the C configuration and being flat, our other molecule can either come in from on top or on bottom. And that results in everything still winds up more or less facing the same way as it was before. Right? And if you try drawing, if we draw the transition state um, and try and show 3D in 3D why this might happen, but we think about, and actually I'm gonna do this on the whiteboard rather than my uh, tablet. So let me switch here. I'm going to draw the diene on the left. So I'm going to try and draw it flat so that it's pointed into the board and out of the board. So we have a carbon and then coming out towards us is another carbon. This is really, this is a double bond. I'm going to show it with two wedges. not two carbons, that's going to the same carbon back there. So we have this flat molecule and our diene ophile it 
is also going to need to be flat in order for these orbitals to line up. So try and draw this one with some perspective to it as well. So it can either approach from on top or underneath, but you're gonna need that dienophile has to approach from the same side. Both of those carbons have to approach from the same side, right? It's not gonna come in perpendicular because remember what we're really looking for is that the pi bonds on all of these on all of these um, carbons, the pi bonds have to overlap to make a new sigma bond. And, and so if we wind up, if we want, we move it down actually. So if this one's approaching from the bottom, we need this pi bond to overlap with the pi bond from our diene. And we need the other dienophile pi bond to overlap with that pi bond at the same time. That's how we're going to get new sigma bonds is if we can take these unhybridized p orbitals and overlap them in a way that looks like a sigma bond. Right? And so we have to have them approach from the same side. You can't have it approach perpendicular um, because otherwise, if you try and do that, you're not going to get any overlap between these p orbitals at the same time. You could get at most one of these p orbitals to overlap with the other. Right? So it has to approach from a flat configuration which I know is kind of, it's something that's a little intuitive, um, but it's, it's a hard rule in this case. It's not just, okay, that's a good way of approximating it. It is 100% how this works. And let me go back to the share screen. Right? And so if we have to have these, our dienophile has to come in from either top or bottom, that's going to result in a, in a limiting which of these possible stereoisomers we're going to get. So let's practice. If we had a dienophile that had two nitriles attached, two cyano groups attached, what product are we going to get? Well, if we have to start, I'm going to draw the diene as being larger and, oops, how did I do that? All right, so if we're going to draw the diene as being larger and therefore our dienophile is going to be coming up from underneath. So if we have these two cyano groups are trans relative to each other, our I bonds that are breaking are going to look like, okay, this pair of electrons moves here, this pair of electrons moves towards that direction, that pair of electrons moves over. Try and visualize it and see that we have these things. Now we're gonna wind up with the top cyanide group, the top nitrile group is gonna be pointing up above the plane of the new ring structure. 
So we'd start by drawing the carbons that we know where they're going to be. It's going to look like this, right? The cyano group that was pointed towards the right is now going to be above the plane of the ring. So we snap these things together. And so the cyano group was pointed out this way. And so now the ring structure, if you flatten the ring structure out, it's pointed upward. And the other nitrile group is going to be pointed downward. All right, so these Diels Alder reactions, part of one of the trickiest parts of this is that you have to recognize that you have a conjugated diene and a dienophile, right? It's not just one functional group we're looking for. It's a very specific conjugated diene and a dienophile. So you need a conjugated diene and something else with a pi bond in order for this to happen. So it's a little bit harder, but it's got it's it's very specific set of of conditions, right? And so. Um, it's not like you can point to it as a functional group like an alcohol and say all alcohols react like this because it's a it's a subset of alkenes. Casey? Yeah, I was going to ask Sean with the last one that we did with the cis. Um, can you have the nair enantomer with that? Yes. And that's going to be a result of if we started with the with the um molecule flipped if when this first came in it's still got to be trans but if you started with it with this cn here and a cn here then we'd wind up drawing a molecule where the the top CN was down and the bottom CN was then up. I right, said so that would be the enantiomer. We flipped both of those stereo centers. And it's just a result of starting with our dienophile oriented the other way. All right. The big thing is that if you start with them trans on our on our dienophile, our product has to have them trans as well. And it only really gets trickier if you have a diene that has other carbons attached. If you had a diene that had an additional methyl there, you have to remember that, okay, when my new carbons come in, they have to be downwards. That's going to, if they're coming from the bottom, that's going to push that methyl group upward. Or if I draw my dienophile is coming from on top, that's going to push that other group downward in our final product, right? So just remember it's, it's, we're bringing our diene up to our dienophile. I think this is, or sorry, this is my diene is the C shape and here's my dienophile. It has to either approach from on top, which pushes everything downward, or has to approach from the bottom, which pushes everything upward. Right, so that the, the trickiest thing is to be able to visualize the transition state. And if you can do that, that's gonna tell you where to put all of your substituents. And for the sake of practice, let's let's add a methyl group to each of these on the diene. Uh, we're going to wind up with too many possible. No, that'll work. C might have a lot of possible stereoisomers, but give that some practice. 
I'll give you guys a couple minutes to work on that and I'll start working through them. All right, so I'm going to start with with A. So remember our our dienophile, which is the molecule on the right, has to approach from either on top or bottom. If it approaches from bottom, then we're going to wind up with a product that looks like So our, our six carbons that we first make are gonna always look the same for these. The methyl that's attached to the bottom, if our dienophile approaches from beneath, that's gonna push this methyl upward. And then the other groups, these esters that are attached here, remember that this is gonna be relative to our dienophile has hydrogens attached the other direction. And so when we add these in, if it's approaching from the bottom and from the same orientation that it is right here, we're going to wind up with these two functional groups, these two esters, also being pointing upward when this is all done. If we wanted to get the, if we were going to get the stereoisomer that has them facing downward, we would have to start with it with our dienophile in the opposite orientation, by which I mean. If we started with it here. So we basically, if we took that dienophile and we flipped it like a pancake so that our, our ester groups were pointed towards the rest of the ring, when we bring it in from underneath, we're going to wind up with these two R groups facing downward. Yeah. So the rest of the molecule doesn't change. So we had a 
carbonyl, an oxygen to a methyl. Carbonyl, oxygen, methyl. All right, so the other possibilities here would be a molecule that looks like, again, all of our ring structures are always going to look the same. That's a possibility as well. If that's if our dienophile approaches from beneath our diene, but flipped over, then there's a, also the possibility, the same two possibilities, except with the methyl at the very bottom carbon being into the board instead of the other way. If we approached with our dienophile being on top of our, this is our diene, we can approach with our dienophile on top, which is gonna push the methyl downward. And so those would look like, Methyl down, R group up, R group up. Methyl down, R group down, R group down. So the two R groups, the two esters, always because they're cis, in our dienophile, they always have to be cis in our product as well. But other than that, we get every possible combination. We can't just write plus EN for these because these are not enantiomers. Because in an enantiomer, we would be flipping every single stereocenter, not just not keeping some of them the same. And right, so we wind up with four possible stereoisomers in this case. If we look at B, this is now not an ester, it's a carboxylic acid group. Um, but it's gonna look, we're gonna get the same four possibilities. Right, if our dienophile comes in from underneath, that pushes our methyl group upward. And if it's in this orientation, R2, Our two acid groups are going to be pointing upward as well. Because when you, when you attach these these electrons, when you make those new pi bonds, you have to put those hydrogens have to go e and the R groups have to go either up or down. And so whatever is drawn, Whatever is drawn towards the right in this in, in this instance is going to be is going to wind up when it flattens out is going to move upward above the ring structure. Whatever is drawn to the left hand side is going to wind up being below the new ring structure. So those are the two possible isomers if our dienophile approaches from underneath the diene. If it approaches from above the diene, we push the methyl down. 
and we can then have our acid groups or R groups facing upward. or downward. So again, in all of these, if we have three stereo centers, if it was if we're drawing all possible stereo centers, if we're just going to put plus en for everything, there should be eight possible ways to do this because you could have you have two to the two to the n number of possible stereo isomers, where n is your number of stereo of chiral carbons. Um, we don't get all of them because we're saying that the two that the acid groups or R groups have to be on the same side because they started out as being cis. So we have every other combination, every possible combination, as long as our two acid groups are on the same side of the ring because these two started cis they have to be cis in every possible product that we draw right? and if we if we didn't have this methyl group here then we would all actually only wind up with one possible product in these cases we just have that there, then it doesn't matter whether we approach from top or bottom, right? If we don't have the methyl group there, then if we approach from top or bottom, we're going to get the same product either way. We're going to get either both of them, if it approaches from on top, of the dienophile, or what um, we could get this isomer, or we could get and is there any difference between those two? They're the same molecule in this case. This is that special case where you look, if you have a stereo center, um, you've got two stereo centers here, two carbons with four different things attached, but you have that internal mirror plane where the molecule is identical on either side of that line. And you can see it visually sometimes easier than drawing that mirror um, because if you took the molecule on the left and you flipped it, vertically like a pancake, you get the molecule on the right. If it didn't have that internal mirror plane, you wouldn't be able to do that. Again, that's, we get the, that's the meso compound. If it has stereo centers, but it doesn't have a stereo isomer, if it doesn't have an enantiomer, Stereo center is the same thing as a chiral center or a chiral carbon, yes. Right, and I, just so it doesn't sound, you know how when you say the same word over and over again, it seems to lose all meaning and sounds start sounding really weird to you. I was mixing it up by putting, saying chiral carbon instead of just saying stereo center and stereo center, stereo center. It starts to sound like Radio Shack competitor. All right, last but not least here. If we have our dienophile has two R groups that are trans relative to each other, they have to be trans in the product as well. So we can get If we wind up with 
ketone up, ketone down. And that approach from the bottom, it would push the methyl group up. And then if it was flipped over to begin with, we could still have it approach from the bottom. So our methyl still has to be up, but we could switch these two. And again, you can't just say plus EN for this one because plus enantiomer means you flip all of the stereocenters. And from these two, we flipped two of them, but not the third. If our dienophile approached from the top, methyl gets pushed down, and then our other two have to be trans relative to each other. And So again, all of the possibilities where our two ketone R groups are trans relative to each other because they started out trans relative to each other in our dienophile. As usual, rings complicate things when it comes to the stereochemistry. But it's the same reaction for each of these. And again, if we didn't have the methyl group, let's do an, a simpler example to, to finish this slide out. If we didn't have the methyl group here, then we could get we get both possible addition products and now because we if we had it flipped over to start with we would be reversing every stereo center not just one of them now we can say plus en or if you wanted to draw it when in doubt you can always draw it the other possibility would be with the two stereo centers flipped. Those are the only two possibilities that keep these two substituents trans relative to each other. All right, a couple more slides, and then we're going to practice drawing bicyclic structures, which do not, contrary to what they sound like, they don't look anything like a bicycle, but they are bicyclic. Um, when we're talking about these Diels Alder reactions, it has to be in that S cis conformer, that shape that looks like a C, because you need to have all of your pi bonds pointed the same direction so that you can get those orbital overlaps happening all at the same time. So if that S cis conformer is the reactive form, and the structure of the diene can actually tell us about how reactive it is. So which of these compounds would we expect to be the most reactive? 
I'll give you a hint. It's the one that spends the most time in the S cis shape. Which one of these is going to be spend the most time as the S cis conformer? It has to be that one, right? That one is going to spend 100% of its time in the S cis conformation. By definition, basically, right? It's stuck in that ring structure, which forces the pi bonds to be pointing the right direction. Out of the two that are left, what's going to be the next most reactive? What's going to be the, the one that spends the most time between the two that are left? Which one spends the most time in the S cis? Left or right? My left, stage left. That one's going to spend some of its time in the S cis configuration, right? It's going to be locked into either S cis or S trans, but it can move back and forth between them pretty easily. You have to break the resonance to switch back and forth, but it's not that hard. It's not breaking a sigma bond to switch back and forth it means this middle structure is going to be the least reactive when it comes to deals all the reactions because it's locked into the s trans conformation in order to get the middle molecule to react in a deals all reaction you have to break sigma bonds and re and rotate things around in order to get it into that s cis shape so the molecule that spends the most time in the S cis conformation is the one that's locked into the S cis conformation. The one that's locked into the S cis S trans is going to be the least reactive. All right, it basically won't react at all in the in a Diels Alder reaction. Um, so this cyclic molecule, the one that was on the right, that's locked into the S cis conformation is called cyclopentadiene. We don't need to specify numbers on it because there's only, there's not really two places that you could um, put the alkene groups. It has to be in this, this shape. So cyclopentadiene um, is so reactive that it reacts with itself in what's called a dimerization. A dimer is not a dime bag. A dimer is when you have two monomers that react together, that stick together. All right, so the, the dimerization is when we have these two molecules reacting with each other to make a larger molecule. And it's going to react. Basically, you're going to have one of these molecules act as the diene, and the other molecule acts as a dienophile. So if we drew our, our mechanism here for the sake of showing what bonds are going to be formed, It's still going to be a four plus two reaction. We're still going to wind up making a cyclohexane group, moving a pi bond over. But it's going to look a little bit weird because we have an extra carbon attached to both ends of our cyclohexane group. So if we start by drawing our cyclohexane, so, and I'm going to draw the our dienophile carbons in blue. Our new bonds are in black. So this is the molecule we just, the cyclo group we just made 
but we didn't do anything that broke apart the cyclo group that was already there, right? Either of the two cyclo groups that was already there. The, the dienophile carbons are still there in a, in a cyclopental ring with one of the pi bonds still there too. So that's what's left of the, clean that up a little bit. That's, that's our blue molecule, our dienophile. The rest of the molecule is still stuck exactly how it was. All we did was break a pi bond and stick it onto the, another molecule, right? Which means we also have that last red carbon. Right, that, that sp3 carbon right here that bridges the gap between the two pi bonds is attached to both of these carbons still on either end. And so you wind up with something it's a very common, this is actually a tricyclic molecule. And again, I'm going to make the bicycle pun again, because in contrast to the way you learn to ride a bike, you start with the tricycle and then progress to the bicycle. Tricyclic products are more complicated than bicyclic products, not less. This would be a perfectly valid way of drawing this compound. And if we wanted to look at, at mole view to get an idea of what this would look like in 3D, we're going to wind up with, so there's our cyclo. Our cyclo group. Here's the pi bond that we moved over. There's the carbon that was bridging the, the two ends of it. And then on the other side, we had something that looks like this. And if we want to see what that actually looks like, there's our starting dienophile, or diene is the five-sided ring here that's got a pi bond there. The six-sided ring that you can see here, now I've got it arranged in a way that uh, would be the pi bond would be on the top carbon here. Um, for the sake of making it look exactly like our structure on the left. Um, there's our six-sided ring that we just made by linking these things together. So you can still kind of see our red and our, those are our red carbons. Those are our blue carbons. Right, so trying to visualize these things in 3D or at least being able to draw them and make sure that you don't leave off any carbons and everything is the same direction. So this one actually technically would be if we had it, oops. So it looks like that because the two hydrogens are pointed downwards. Those are the two hydrogens from the dienophile. We could also have a possibility with those facing away where the two hydrogens and the rest of the ring structure were flipped would result in these, the ring structures being kind of almost on top of each other. 
Um, and if we have MoleView clean this up, it'll actually redraw it for us in a way that kind of that looks less intuitive. Um, but you can kind of you can see the this kind of distorted boat shape and boat in terms of cyclohexane conformers. Here's our boat. Two ends of the boat are linked by carbon in the middle. That's this carbon. So it drew the enantiomer because MolView doesn't always get the stereochemistry right. Um, so it's backwards from what we have drawn here. Um, for this one, where you have something this complicated, those three cyclo groups, I think the way that we started drawing it like this makes more sense. Draw it with the six sided ring as being flat and then add the other rings onto it as necessary. All right, let's see. There's what ha do I have next, and do we want to get into it right now? All right, so this is we will we'll end a few few minutes early. We won't get into this today. Um, we're going to add yet another vocab for describing where things are on a ring structure. Um, so I will save that and we'll talk about that on Tuesday and then get into what the um, what the preferred products will be. So we'll pick up here on Tuesday. We have a quiz later today. I'll get it get it all set up and ready to go for you guys. Um, it'll probably involve some practice drawing these bicyclic structures as well as some of the other reactions we've looked at so that you can get some practice. And here's your, it's with the three minutes I have left, here's your tip for drawing these by hand, is you start by drawing two inverted Vs that are sort of offset a little bit. Those are gonna be the carbons that make up the six-sided ring structure. They make up the cyclo group, right? So, show it on the board here. So inverted V and draw another inverted V that's offset by just a little bit. If you use your imagination, that's like looking at a boat conformer of cyclohexane from, from the end, from the, is it the prow of the boat, um, from the front of the boat, from Jack, Jack's position on uh, Titanic, right? You're looking at the front of the boat, looking back at the boat. Then you add another V and it can be helpful to, and I didn't offset these enough. You add another V that's a lot steeper between the two. Now, all of a sudden, that looks like something that you can actually visualize. And if we flattened this out, the reason why it's helpful to draw it like this is because if we have a bunch of substituents off to the side, it can be advantageous to draw it like this so that you can see axial versus equatorial interactions and things like that. Um, the, uh, this, the other way of drawing this would just be to draw a hexagon with two wedges that meet in the middle. You see how those are kind of the same structure. If I take this boat structure that's pointing out towards us and flatten it and look at it from the top, then you get this same shape over here. Right. And then whatever was attached over here to this would be where our dienophile attached. This is what's left of our dienophile. And so whatever was attached here, if it was in a trans conformer, it might look like this. And actually that one's not gonna be coming slightly towards us. 
but you have to get back into the habit of drawing these things like axial versus equatorial in order to see some of these interactions we're going to talk about next week. Right, so I know that nobody wants to remember how to draw the axial versus equatorial positions on a cyclohexane, but we're going to have to think about it a little bit. All right, so we'll end there. Take the quiz this weekend. And um, I do have office hours at 1030 for anybody who has any questions or wants to go over some more of these or had any issues with it. All right. Otherwise, have a good weekend. Bye, guys. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Sean.